Drink beer, it's good for you. Hello, and welcome to the video. In this video, we'll be looking at everything American Pow Ow. This will begin with its history and then move into BJCP style notes, recipe writing, my suggested recipe, and then I will show you some footage from my latest brew to this style with lots of hints and tips along the way. Let's get started with a brief history. The Pau is an important style today but dates back to the very early 1700s in England. It found its original home in Burton-on-Trent because the water supply there had one key advantage in that it contains high amounts of sulphites. This provided great clarity and high bittering tolerance which was key to this style. This allowed more hops to be added throughout the boiling process and this beer style became the most common beer drunk for a long long time. Once the water chemistry was understood then this water profile spread throughout England and then beyond into the world. This Burton water profile is still used by many worldwide but this style is very overshadowed by the offspring style that is known as IPA. The IPA is a pale ale that was dry hopped to keep it fresh for long periods, usually at sea. The pale ale is essentially the same beer but without the dry hops. Which let's face it today is not always the case with lots of examples coming known as pale ale with dry hops. Make of this what you will, but to many people's minds this makes it an IPA and not a pale ale. Make your own choices here, of course. An American pale ale is essentially a similar in ways beer style to its originator, but with American ingredients and expression. The commercial beer market is simply bursting with examples, and the American adaptation has now clearly overshadows its British parentage a long time back. American Pal Ow is now brewed worldwide, not just by breweries but also by home brewers in their masses. This is one style that has really benefited from time, and new ideas are ongoing. Let us now see how the BJCP see this style in short form. Starting with aroma, moderate to strong aroma, and they say this can come from either late kettle additions or dry hops. Make of this what you will. Usually this is with citrus hop flavours, low to moderate maltiness, small amounts of speciality malts, bready, toasty, biscuity, moderate to no fruity esters. Appearance. Pale gold to deep amber, moderately large white to off-white head, with good head retention. Generally fair clarity, but some haze acceptable. Flavour. Moderate to high hop flavour, wide array of American hop choices, low to moderate maltiness, optional with bready, toasty, biscuit or caramel in low amounts. Fruity esters, moderate to none, excessive grassy notes are not to style. Mouthfeel, medium light to medium body, carbonation moderate to high, overall smooth finish without astringency often associated with high hopping rates. Overall impression, a pale, refreshing and hoppy ale, yet with sufficient supporting malt to make the beer balanced and drinkable. The clean hop presence can reflect classic or modern American or New World hop varieties with a wide range of characteristics. An average strength hop forward pale American craft beer generally balanced to be more accessible than modern American IPAs. I've now put the vital statistics on screen at the bottom, but naturally the most important numbers are those BUGU ratios, which I've also added to the screen now, that show a minimum, a maximum, and also an average. Hopefully this makes you realise how much variation there is actually in this style. Many of my viewers like to do a screenshot of this page, so do that now if you feel that it would be useful. Let us now look at recipe writing to this style. The Pale Ale beer style was originally named as such because it was mostly just Pale Ale malt with a little crystal malt for head retention. The classic grain bill is as simple as 95% Pale Ale and 5% crystal malt. Many breweries worldwide still stick to this as a grain bill. Others like to get a little bit more creative with the grain and will add in malts such as Pilsner and Munich as part of the main fermentable grain bill. Pilsner can totally replace Pale Ale and this will give you a more crisp, less grain-like taste which can work very well for allowing your hops to shine further. A balance of Pale Ale and Pilsner is very common also with Munich malt working more as a support grain at around 30%. There are also some of what I call flare grains that are known to be used for this style, and these are biscuit, aromatic and melanoidin. 
The biscuit malt is very gently roasted and to my mind is going to give you more of a cracker taste than biscuit. Use this sparingly in this style between 1 to 3%. Aromatic malt is not a subdued malt at all and will give you a large amount of malt taste very quickly if you are not careful with it. There are popular commercial examples out there that use this at a rate of up to 5% usually. If you are trying this in a parallel of your own for the very first time, then I suggest you start at 1% and build from there for the future, especially with some versions of this malt being more powerful in flavour than others. Melanoidin or melanoid malt shares traits with Munich malt but has more aroma and more colour. At between 1-3% this produces a decoction mash type effect giving body with fullness to an APA which I really like. Naturally the subtle flavours of this malt are lost within the hoppiness of a palau though. In terms of hop additions, the classic APA will always start with a bittering hop at the beginning of the boil which is usually 60 minutes. If you see any 30 minute additions in a recipe then I would suggest you move them to 15 minutes where they can actually have a better effect. It is also very common to see 10, 5 minute and 0 minute additions for this style. To fully understand how these addition times have effect on your brew then please refer to my separate video guide shown on screen now after this one. The hops that you should use with this style really should be American or at the very least the end result tasting mostly of American hops. The classics like Cascade, Centennial and Amarillo work very well but there are simply many hops that also work great in this style. Here are some examples on screen of pairings that are popular in no particular order. Naturally the possibilities here are actually endless but what is vital here is to use these in accordance to the BUGU ratios that I discussed and showed earlier. What would be very interesting is if viewers could provide details of their favourite APA hop combinations along with BUGU if possible within the comments section of this video and then we can get a nice list of ideas for people to refer to and try. And now lastly but very importantly let's move on to the subject of yeast choice. Yeast for this style certainly does vary. I will start with liquid yeast but this is not done out of preference over dry yeast. Yeast is simply yeast and it is important to understand that. Liquid yeast wise some enjoy the fruity esters of Y yeast 1272 American Owl 2 which is a form of Liberty yeast but the classic will be White Lab 001 Californian Owl yeast which is still the best selling yeast for White Labs and was their very first. This yeast is very popular for hoppy styles because it simply allows the hop flavours to go way past it. Dry yeast wise you can actually go in exactly the same direction. If you want those Liberty flavours then Mangrove Jack's M36 will give you them or the classic most popular neutral yeast of all is, yes you guessed it, Fermentis US05. As much as US05 presents a popular option for hoppy styles I would urge people to try different yeast also instead of just defaulting to this one. You never know you may prefer the results elsewhere. Speaking of which, if you are a fake user like me, then I would recommend the following types. Vosjanas, Framgarden and Ebergarden. Vosjanas will not usually give much flavour in a beer style of this strength, but will allow the hops to come forward. Framgarden will allow some yeast flavour and usually Ebergarden will be quite neutral, but it really depends on which version you use. Some isolates can be very different to the farm version. My farm version is direct from the farm and that Kveg owner just uses it for hoppy beer styles these days. This is now the end screen of this section is ready for screenshotting as I know many of my viewers do. Let's move on from here and have a look at water before we go on to the brew and my recipe. In terms of a water profile I would suggest the following. This profile comes from Randy Mosher and it has many fans for American Parallel including myself. If you have not tried it then do so. It works very well. Let's now move on to my most popular tried and tested recipe for this style and at the same time I will show you some footage from my latest brew of this recipe. My full recipe is available on the Brewfather recipe platform and you will find a link in this video's description to that along with the recipe written in full for a batch size of 23 litres. As you can see I brewed this using the Brewtools 40 litre system but naturally this recipe can be adapted for any method or brewing system using Brewfather or similar software so that it is at a volume that suits your method and desired volume.
I recommend Brewfather based on the fact that it is easy to use, accurate and free if you limit the amount of recipes you store in it. Let's start with the grain bill. Here I will talk percentages. In my shared tried and tested recipe I use a 50-50 split on the base malts of Palau and Pilsner which in this recipe means 46% of each. I have to say that I really like the effect this has on this style. It allows the malt side to drop down some to allow the hops to pass through while still retaining some malt backbone that is required for this style. I use carapils at 5% to allow this some sparkle and that all important head retention. If you cannot obtain carapils then a low colour crystal malt will do the same job. Just be sure to get one as low in colour as possible. Then I'm using melanoidin malt at 3% of the grist to give this beer a further fullness and body that I believe pushes it into a better dimension of taste. You will not get the flavour from the melanoidin here of course, but that's not the purpose here. Try it and you should see what I mean. Hops wise I really love the combination of Centennial and Amarillo and I've found via market research through breweries that this combination works great commercially for high ratings also. It's simply a hop marriage made in heaven for this style. Centennial is a well known super cascade hop. It has a very similar citrus characteristic yet very much enhanced. I also very much enjoy its high floral flavour and aroma. Amarillo balances this with its distinctive orange flavouring along with its tropical citrus, lemon and grapefruit characteristics. This combination of hops simply spells classic APA. As you will know I use a boil addition at 60 and then bring on the flavour and aroma at 10, 5 and 0 minutes. I use a hop stand at 80 degrees C or 176 degrees Fahrenheit at the end of the boil to really bring out those flavours and aromas. You will note that I do not use dry hops. To my mind if I did then this would make this an IPA, but that is also down to the end brewer. Make your own decisions and choices, it is after all your beer. This recipe makes for a very fresh and crisp tasting hoppy classic APA with some extra flair. There is however one last consideration in this recipe, yes, you got it, it's the yeast. You will note that I have only chilled this wort now down to 41 degrees C, which is just under 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, you guessed it, I'm going in with Vos Janus Quake. You will also note that I'm using the new firm Zilla for this fermentation. I pitched the Quake at just over 40 degrees C, but set the temperature to just 25 degrees C. I really love the effect this makes with this yeast. If you are true to its real pitching rate, then it literally springs into action within an hour or so. Fermentation at 25 degrees C also enables this quake to have a very lager-like profile. On top of this, I also fermented this under 10 psi of pressure. This allows the hops to literally stream through along with a nice, crisp, light profile. At this low temperature for the yeast but under pressure, the fermentation is over in a little over two days. When it comes to fermentation of quake yeast, I always leave them in the fermentation vessel for at least 7 days though, irrespective of how long the fermentation itself actually takes. Experience has shown me to do this because it allows the yeast itself to clean up after itself. Quake needs to do this also of course. This whole arrangement of techniques is something that I have been testing for a short time, but so far I really love the results and this beer did not disappoint either. Here is an image of how things looked after fermentation. This was then transferred into a keg using a closed loop transfer. This type of transfer is a great way of protecting your beer against the enemy of oxygen and this is particularly important for styles where you wish to keep that hoppy goodness fresh and strong. And finally I know that some of you are very keen to see the end beer, so here it is in a young but tasting rather good state if I do say so myself. To my mind a good APA will have mass accessibility and high drinkability along with the appropriate balance in malt to hops. Do let me know what you think once you have brewed this. I also hope to hear from you in regards to your thoughts for the APA hop combinations as asked for earlier on in this video. This will also be a topic on my channel's Facebook group if you have not joined yet and wish to then there are details on screen now. 
This now brings this video to a close. If you have any questions, then please let me know via YouTube or Facebook. I do hope that you've found this video to be useful, interesting and enjoyable. If appropriate, then please like this video on YouTube. And if you've not done so already, then please subscribe. I regularly post new content. Happy brewing!